podcasts. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, just talk quickly about the agenda again. We have our guest speaker, Kathy Encino, and then I'm going to just kind of piggyback on some of the things she'll be talking about with some resources and tools that we have on our website and talk about them to, again, as I was mentioning before, talk about how we can implement some of these things in the lives of residents. What are the tools? What are the resources there to really make it happen? And now without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy. Uh, Kathy is, and she presented, I meant to, to pull up the link to the her presentation because we have that on YouTube as well. She presented in the late summer, I believe, I think it was August or September of last year. And it was really just a tremendous uh, program on reimagining nursing homes. You know, we'd all been through COVID or, or midway through COVID at that point, hopefully. And um, you know, thinking about where do we go from here? This is obviously not working for residents, but how can we reimagine nursing home care? And this is really a, um, uh, I think a good adjunct to that program. Standalone, of course, but that um, uh, we'll hear from Kathy about some of the things that she has done, some of her thoughts, et cetera. But I just wanna mention a little bit about Kathy's background. Um, she, she mentioned to, to us in terms of her credentials that she is a psychotherapist and that she's also been an advocate in aging justice. Um, but that doesn't do Kathy justice, to be honest. Um, I just have the, the utmost respect and esteem for Kathy. She's intelligent and she is thoughtful and she really gets these issues from a resident perspective and from people who are um, trying to, 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 to fulfill our mission in, in essence and the mission of, of others, including Kathy's mission to how do we make nursing homes a humane and um, pleasant and dignified setting for the residents and trying to overcome, as I mentioned at the start, this disparity between or disconnect between the rules, which are really, you know, the requirements, the standards are really good. And the reality that most residents live pretty poor quality of life. And it just, it doesn't have to be that way. So I, I don't want to take up any more of her time. I'm going to uh, just stop sharing my screen so we can hand it over to Kathy. So just one second, please stop sharing. And then I will uh, stop my video. And without further ado, here is Kathy Encino. Kathy, thank you so, so much for joining us today. I'm, I'm personally looking forward to the program. Thank you very much, Richard. And um, to all of you, um, I have a, I'm sorry, there's, okay, now it's fine. And thanks to all of you for tuning in today. We're gonna to talk about opening the door to a better future for older Americans. And uh, we're gonna find there, there are three problems with opening that door. Uh, the first is that uh, for years, that door has been painted over and over again uh, with, um, with ageist paint. So that the programs and services that have been developed for older people in the United States uh, have often been created uh, within an ageist attitude, which limits their effectiveness for older people. And we say that with all due respect to both home and community-based services, as well as uh, nursing home services. Uh, and uh, so the second problem with opening the door uh, is um, that there are people on the other side uh, who don't want us to open it. And so we'll take a look at that problem. And the third problem of opening the door to a better future for older people um, is that once we open the door, in what direction do we go? Fortunately, we already have a North Star that will orient us in the direction we need to go because an ageist agenda brings us over here uh, so that we'll always wind up with a disappointing result. The North Star that will guide us uh, we'll focus the compass in a way that will help us uh, find ways in home and community-based services, as well as in nursing homes, where people are helped to strengthen themselves intellectually, physically, and socially, so that everybody, regardless of level of cognitive and or physical frailty, um, will be able to have a good life. And that's what we're trying to do. We talked about uh, there being people on the other side of the door who are resisting the transformative change that we need. 
uh, we're seeking a very important change, not tinkering around the edges anymore, not rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic anymore, because it's really important that we make substantive change. And yet some people on the other side of the door are saying, no, everything has to stay the way it is. Well, the most um, obvious people on the other side of the door are those who are profiteers. Uh, there's an increasing number of for-profit players in nursing homes. And um, uh, they feel that, uh, nurse, that elderly people can be like personal property or commodities. They're no longer earning money and uh, not paying taxes. So they can be disparaged and disregarded. Uh, but in ways, you know, their marketing presents that they are running wonderful state-of-the-art facilities, uh, but they're really uh, reaping huge profits um, um, by making, by cutting back on staff, for instance. The staffing issue is so crucial. Uh, nursing homes are already notoriously understaffed, but the for-profit uh, chains uh, understaff uh, by much, much more. So we have no objection to people making lots of money, as much money as they want to make. But it's never okay to make money by hurting people. And that's what a lot of them do. And then of course, um, they uh, pay into political campaigns and they uh, make contributions to political parties. So the discerning voter needs to always be aware, where does my elected official stand in all this? Nursing homes and services to older people, home and community based are not peripheral, inconsequential issues in our country. These are important central issues in defining what kind of people we want to be. So we're looking at those uh, elected officials who habitually take money from, uh, from bad players and from some members of the industry. And we're pleading with politicians, stop taking money from the industry. And we note that some very ambitious politicians and high profile politicians are beginning to return those contributions. And we're really very appreciative of that. So we want more and more people to understand the issues and to be um, uh, vigilant about who we vote for. I write regularly to uh, elected officials and, uh, and I will vote according to the type of response that I get because this issue is central uh, to me and it should be central to people of all ages because those who are middle-aged will very soon become old young people too, time flies by so quickly. I can't imagine how quickly the years have gone by for me. So it really is an issue that should concern people of every age because you too eventually will need or benefit from these services or someone you love very much will. Now, other people on the other side of the door are pushing against it um, are some very well-intentioned administrators. Um, who are just, uh, it's daunting. Their job is very hard. It's complex to run uh, a nursing home. I would probably not be able to do it, being honest. So I'm hoping that some who are pushing against the door will realize that we're on their side if, if they're willing to take a look at how to help transform their facilities into places where nursing home residents can grow in strength uh, physically, intellectually, and socially. Now we mentioned that there's already a North Star pointing us in this direction that's really much more holistic, much more beautiful in home and community-based services and in nursing homes. And that's our Magna Carta, it's already been done. And that was the Nursing Home Reform Act of 1987, where some very wise people um, created this and uh, what it says, it says a lot of different things. It's already the law of the land, but as Richard said, it's not being enforced. But as I was thinking about this program, I realized that maybe what's also needed in addition to enforcement is help in understanding how do you help elderly people grow um, uh, to their highest practicable level, intellectually, physically, and socially when we associate old age with growing frailty. Um, uh, how is it possible to do that? So what we're gonna do today 
is to actually talk about how to achieve these things in the Nursing Home Reform Act. And, and uh, because we want those who in, are in departments of health, whose responsibility it is to enforce these things, and they don't, we want them to understand how nursing homes and home and community-based programs can actually do this. Um, some say, um, and, and I realize that some of you who have uh, signed up for today's program uh, have said, you know, maybe, maybe we should just have home and community-based services. Maybe, maybe we don't need nursing homes. I plead with you not to think along those lines. Um, it reminds me of what happened um, just a couple of decades ago when uh, psychiatric hospitals in our country operated so poorly that people said, these are a disgrace, we have to close them. And what's the result? Mentally ill people, people who need treatment and services are now homeless, living in overcrowded shelters, living on sub in subway cars, on park benches, under bridges. We have to do better than this. Uh, some uh, are in jail, uh, are imprisoned, uh, really because there's mental illness, not because they're criminals, and they need services to help them. So I'm not one of these people who say uh, nursing homes are so awful, we ought to, awful, we ought to close them down. No, no, no. The last thing we want are elderly people being homeless. Some are already, by the way, being transferred into homeless shelters. No, stop, stop. We can have, have nursing homes and home and community-based services uh, really be much richer and fuller for all people. You know? Ageism is a funny thing. You know, we, we, uh, we might be impatient with an older person crossing the street when we're trying to get somewhere, or we're on a long line in a supermarket or pharmacy and an older person is fumbling with his credit card as I might or the keys drop or something, we're impatient. But the biggest fear and driver of ageism, I think, is our own fear of our own aging, uh, our own growing possibility of growing frailty, cognitively and physically. And so we don't wanna think about it. And so we're not quick to uh, respond when people um, either openly disparage older people you know, as in the saying, uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And that's as false as it can be because older people, like all people, take great joy in learning. Even with cognitive and physical challenges, there is great pleasure and we learn every day. Some of us learn in different ways to either appreciate the beauty of nature, the beauty of music, the beauty of companionship, beauty of art, of literature, of friendship. Um, there's so much in life where, that we add to our lives every day and we grow from uh, that elderly people, perhaps even more than many, uh, appreciate things that are more inner to ourselves uh, because we can no longer hit that great overhand tennis shot or that uh, backhand up the line, you know, that we used to, we thought we were great stuff and it was better than chocolate have learned that to live a fulfilling, satisfying life as an older person, we have to do a couple of things. We have to keep adding every day to life things that are beautiful, interesting, um, uh, uh, adding to our appreciation of things in life. And we have to go inner. When the outer things are no longer possible, there's great adventure in going inner. So it's important for middle-aged people and young people to start being physically active, uh, helping our bodies grow as strong as possible at every age, um, keep going inner and strengthening our capacity to appreciate beauty um, and to appreciate relationships uh, of which the highest of course is loving and being loved. And uh, none of that is excluded to older people, the oldest people. You know. I want to tell you about some resources um, that are uh, very exciting. And one of them, uh, for instance, there, there is a, a group uh, of three <laughs> wonderful friends and colleagues who together have created a very interesting paper. I'd like you to bring out your pens and paper to just copy down an address that I'm going to give you. 
So those of you who are really interested in the subject and have experience with home and community-based services and nursing homes, those of you who have something to contribute to this can ask for this material. It's a call to action that was formulated by um, three wonderful people, Barry Barkin in California, Rosemary Fagan in Georgia, and Jeff Jerricker in Colorado. And it's called, I have it here. This is what it looks like. And um, you can send for it by email. It's called, I'm sorry. It's called uh, the, the Live Oak Project. And uh, what they're trying to do is to attract other people with expertise in the field of aging to help them um, transform the culture of aging, to help transform services, whether it's in nursing homes or home and community-based services, to look at everything, how things are reimbursed, how they're structured, how they're formulated. And so the discrete expertise that everyone can bring to that would be very welcome by uh, Barry Rosemary and Jeff. And you can get this by emailing Barry, B-A-R-R-Y, short, uh, small letters, at liveoakinitiative.org, live with a capital L, oak, O-A-K with a capital O, and institute with a capital I, dot org, liveoakinstitute.org, and they will send it to you. Now, the roadmap we talked about, the Magna Carta says, in addition to proper, it talks about proper staffing, and I just want to refer to what Richard said before. Uh, years ago, Dr., the wonderful Dr. Charlene Harrington from California and others um, worked hard on this issue of safe staffing. And uh, they developed, um, uh, they did a lot of research and found that 4.1 hours of nursing uh, would be uh, the minimal that's needed in order to offer uh, really good care. And that was years before um, the uh, level of illness even increased. So I believe it's probably going to be realistically even more than 4.1 hours of nursing care. But New York State now is thinking about beginning to do what other states do, which is to require minimal staffing. And they're starting with 3.5 hours, which is much lower, but it's a beginning. And so we maybe, I'm sure Richard will talk about this later, but it's important for all of us to advocate for those kinds of things in our state, in New York state, and in whatever state in which you live, it's so important. You know, um, a person who manages a baseball team knows that it takes nine players. So what we have in understaffed nursing homes is probably, I'm guessing, the not-for-profits have maybe six players on the field. So you can't really play baseball with that. The four profits have maybe three players on the field and the cumulative effect on nursing home residents and on the staff closest to them is really terrible. So please support safe, safe staffing. Safe staffing. Uh, that's one of the issues uh, that the uh, Magna Carta, that the Nursing Home Reform Act of 1987 deals with. But the one that I want to emphasize today is that they found it important to help people strengthen themselves as much as possible, physically, intellectually, and socially. Um, and, um, and it's really so important that now what we have going on are every week, it seems, I read another article by a scientist who says that physical exercise actually improves brain function. They're writing now a lot about the plasticity of the human brain and how we can be strengthened to function. No, it's not a cure of Alzheimer's, for Alzheimer's, no. But we can help strengthen people's functioning by um, making it possible for people to exercise. That's not taking place in most nursing homes, and I don't believe it's taking place sufficiently in home and community-based services. We have this whole um, uh, opportunity that senior centers, this is going to be post COVID, uh, and everything I'm talking about is pre COVID and post COVID. Uh, senior centers uh, do an important, uh, offer an important service in providing meals, both the nutrition and the socialization in senior centers. But the capacity to do much, much more is endless and would be wonderful 
if senior centers had opportunities for exercise, a treadmill, um, by recumbent bikes and exercise programs. If they had classes, um, some wonderful community-based organizations do offer classes and online because uh, we derive great pleasure from growing, from strengthening ourselves uh, physically, intellectually, and socially. Nursing homes certainly have an opportunity, have an urgent need to provide uh, uh, exercise, good exercise. But we, what we see in some of the new models coming through with tremendously effective marketing and PR, they're very, very good at that. But they're presenting essentially the most sedentary models we've ever had, where the resident just walks or is wheeled a few feet from their private room to a central room where they spend the entire day in a sedentary way. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, no real meaningful activities to help people strengthen themselves physically, intellectually, and socially. It's, it's really still perpetuating an ageist myth <laughs> that we will have good lives when we're really sedentary, passive, docile, fairly static. It's not interesting enough to watch other people uh, vacuuming or cleaning the floor or cooking and cleaning up dishes. Uh, we need to be active ourselves and productive and actually contributory to other people. So I wanna talk about some initiatives that uh, some providers have come up with that are really no noteworthy and should be known. One of them is, um, uh, Jewish Home of Bridgeport uh, or Jewish Social Services of Fairfield, Connecticut, something like that. A few years ago, a friend of mine, Sandy Myers, brought me to see a remarkable program they had, which was in this regular nursing home or good nursing home, a work center where those people who lived in the nursing home who wanted to could go to work every day and get paid for their work right in the facility itself. They would clock in. Uh, these were uh, uh, programs with the Department of Labor, with all kinds of strict um, protocols, and uh, residents with great uh, fine motor skills and uh, very sharp um, mentally did the more sophisticated part of the operation. Those who were more frail uh, would take uh, would be able to do um, part of the the operation that required uh, the, the skills that they could bring. What was wonderful was the repartee among the people in the group. Uh, they were also earning money. Uh, the major corporations uh, were brought on board for this. So that was a wonderful initiative and I understand that they still have it, although I haven't seen it now for some eight to 10 years, but it was wonderful to see people happily engaged and uh, having fun. And when I asked one person, what's the downside? I see you having a great time. What's the downside for you? And he said, oh, well, we have to take a, a lunch break for an hour. I hate leaving this. This is so much fun for me. And the weekends, I miss it because we can only work Monday through Friday. And I really miss it on weekends. It's just wonderful to be with my friends and to be doing this together. So that's one initiative. Um, another is um, uh, what I saw at St. Joseph's residence in Seattle, uh, a residence for retired nuns, elderly nuns. And they voted on a couple of things that they wanted to add to their nursing home, one of which was they wanted to convert, and they did, an individual resident room into a small gym. And it had a, a treadmill and a recumbent bike and some other exercise equipment. And it had, uh, brilliantly, three chairs so that people waiting their turns could sit there. It became uh, an enjoyable kibitzing um, place with repartee and so on. And I approached, I mentioned this in an earlier program, but when I approached the woman on the treadmill who looked blissful, um, I said, you really like this? She said, oh, it's just changed my life. She was dependent on carrying oxygen all the time. She said, I'm getting weaker. I have to carry oxygen. So I couldn't really walk well. I come to the treadmill, I park the oxygen tank on the rim and I hold on and I can walk. And they have 10 minute limits. So I walk freely for 10 minutes. Others take their turns and as soon as it's available again, I'm back on it. Uh, I find that it helps me to think better too. It helps me be stronger and it helps my thinking. 
And I want to say amen to her for that because uh, exercise helps my thinking too. I'm most creative when I'm on the treadmill. <laughs> I'm most creative when I'm using the stationary bike. When I have to write something, I have to first think it out while I'm exercising. Or if I used to be walking in Central Park, that's when I'd have my best thinking. If I sit down to write, I can't be creative freely. So, and those of you who remembered years ago when I used to do speaking before large live audiences, I always grab the mic and would walk around the stage as I spoke because movement really helps me think. Now with Zoom, I have to stay put and sit and I'm finding it a bigger challenge. If I could only walk around and talk with you, uh, it would be um, easier for me. But scientists are saying that exercise promotes um, uh, strengthening uh, of, of the mind. And so uh, we really want to urge home and community-based services post-COVID and nursing homes post-COVID to really plan on having exercise equipment available to older people. It's essential. How can we not do this? The other facility I want to uh, bring to your attention is Providence Mount St. Vincent, also in Seattle. Its CEO is Charlene Boyd. And um, Charlene, uh, when I went to visit there also quite a few years ago, had some remarkable things and she's renewing things again to make it even better. But one of the things that was so memorable is they had an indoor garden club. And to make it possible for people to uh, plant, to, to plant things and grow things was um, they had a table where carpenters had made um, uh, holes so you could actually put pots in the different holes and people in wheelchairs or seated would be able to actually plant things and so on from a seating position. That was one of the things I remembered. And also Charlene, I think pioneered a daycare program there starting with her own toddler son uh, years ago so that the generations um, uh, would have wonderful opportunities together. So Charlene Boyd is um, an administrator that is, uh, deserves a lot of praise. Um, also, oh, by the way, I believe Charlene started out as an occupational therapist, if I'm not mistaken. And um, it's interesting because that occupational therapy movement was preceded by the arts and crafts movement. And a wonderful man that I worked with years ago, Dr. Yasha Lysenko, pioneered um, using art and crafts in all of his senior programs with people who were totally blind and uh, many of whom had other um, physical and cognitive challenges. And uh, Yasha felt that art forms itself need to be available to people. Um, uh, and and uh, what he would do is hire the artist because the passion and fervor for that art form would be conveyed. So there were people who were totally blind, who were sculpting in stone using filing systems, totally blind people who were sewing or knitting or, or using fiber arts or doing all kinds of creative things. Uh, and Yasha felt, and I, oh, ceramists, um, uh, music programs, classes of all kinds, that it makes people happy when we grow. And so that's what I'm hoping that um, we rethink uh, the role of the important introduction into life of all these opportunities for people to create interesting and beautiful things in home and community-based centers and in nursing homes. There's another administrator that I want to call to your attention, except he's in Northern Maine, but for the life of me, I can't remember his name or the name of the nursing home. But one morning, uh, he ran a, a pretty good nursing home in Northern Maine, and one morning he was having breakfast with his wife and he confided, you know, I don't look forward to going to work. I run a pretty good nursing home. But it's, uh, you know, we're all from farm families. When I was a kid, you know, my parents, uh, we all ran a farm. And that's true of the staff. They're all from farm families. And the residents for sure were all farmers themselves and the whole neighborhood, our whole area are farmers. So the nursing home environment, the institutional environment feels so alien. And his wife was saying, so what do you want to do? What are you thinking? 
he's now showing some real passion, some real excitement. He said, well, you know, we've got some acreage behind the nursing home, quite a few acres. And I was thinking, what if, what if, is it crazy? What if we made a farm behind the nursing home so that the residents, while they couldn't do farming, could um, render opinions about the soil composition and where the sun is and irrigation and what crops prosper where and so on, or at least even to oversee and to enjoy something that's familiar to them. Same with staff, same with families. And so it was that he met with his senior staff as soon as he got to the nursing home. And instead of uh, feeling um, hesitant, they were enthusiastic. And that led to a meeting with staff on all three shifts. Their enthusiasm was off the charts, so much off the charts that after he got through with the first shift, the second and third shifts had already heard about it and were enthusiastic. Same with families and residents, same with the neighborhood. And so it was that they started to plant crops and use the food, the produce, as food in the nursing home. And whatever was left over, staff could take home and cook and use. Same with families. Um, people in the town helped. They could sell whatever was left over too and make money to keep the project going. So here was a very creative person uh, going way outside the box to try to figure out a way that all the people uh, would have opportunities to grow. It helps strengthen the relationships, the pleasure going through those halls, people talking all the time excitedly about what was happening and what they needed to do to plan ahead. But now I want to tell you about, oh, and there's one other thing. Uh, I'll tell you a story about a man in a nursing home who um, when the CNA, very elderly frail man, when the CNA, the certified nursing assistant went in uh, to um, uh, help him with breakfast, she was alarmed because it looked as if the way he was breathing, that he was at death's door. So she ran and got the nurse who came in and said immediately, call his daughter. And the nurse, he grabbed the nurse's hand and she said, Mr. So-and-so, is there something I can help you with? Yes, he said, yes. As he was gasping for air, please tell my daughter, Maria, that she's the only person who's ever really cared for me. She's the only person that really loved me. She's been so devoted to me and I've taken her for granted. I never said to her, I love you, Maria, thank you. And with that, he died. So you know, when his daughter arrived, the nurse was able to say this to her, something she remember, will remember for the rest of her days. And I keep thinking, wouldn't have been wonderful for this man and for this daughter and for all the men and women in nursing homes and home and community-based services and for all of us, if they had the advantage of this uh, movement that's growing in, in, in interest of the ethical will, which has nothing to do with money. It's, it's a letter that one writes or is helped to write to those that you most love, family members or people that you love the most, to tell them what they mean to you, um, to thank them, to tell them of your values. It's, it's a legacy and a person that I know well who's been doing this uh, beautifully is a, a woman named Amy Paul. And uh, I think, I think it's called, oh yes, Heirloom Works, H-E-I-R-L-O-O-M Works, W-O-R-K-S. And uh, she's someone who's done this among other people with ethical wills. It, it would have given this man an opportunity to get there even sooner. So he and his daughter would have enjoyed um, perhaps an enhanced relationship, although she had done beautifully. I wanna tell you a little about um, the work that I did and mine was intuitive. It's before the scientists really confirmed how important exercise is, how important um, socializing is, it's crucial. And so I introduced group into nursing homes because I'm a great believer in the healing powers of group. I'm trained as an individual psychotherapist, but I've also trained in group. And years ago, one of my earliest, most moving professional experiences was forming a group of children of latency age, um, because one child had been so severely abused with her, uh, her eye burned, her arms broken, you know, just um, malnourished and dehydrated by her uh, parents, 
that she had lost the power to speak, not physiologically, but from the trauma, from the chronic trauma, she could no longer speak. We don't have time for me to go into it now, but it was within group that she began to heal. One-on-one -on -one didn't work, didn't do anything. The child psychiatrist with me, with whatever. But when I put her in group, um, uh, it was healing for her. And she began to speak in whispers, just began. So we look at nursing homes and say, we have a congregate setting. How can we not do groups? My goodness, you know, how can we not do this? So I started groups. Oh, by the way, when you go in as a consultant, you don't go in like a missionary, you know, with a prescriptive top-down formula. You have to cultivate the soil. You have to cultivate um, the environment for both residents and staff. And I consider it erecting a human scaffolding to lift the weight of the institution from their shoulders so that they themselves have the strength and the courage that it takes to begin to become the change agents themselves, not coming down like this, but from the bottom up, it's really quite beautiful. I started intuitively because I didn't know, I mean, there were 70% of the residents had significant cognitive loss, maybe 30% had significant physical frailty. I don't believe in segregating people by illness. The natural mix that comes actually works very well. So I started in group uh, with singing, uh, just intuitively trying to find what would be the, and then going from singing, after a while they got to know each other, the pleasure of it, uh, the community building aspect of it um, was, uh, was noteworthy. And then we could begin with poetry. We could begin with discussions of everything. We welcome new members. We, we uh, congratulated those who had achieved things. They themselves began to reach out to each other by name. Instead of being just lined up against the, the wall, silent, they became friends. They got to know each other, uh, to enjoy each other's company. Um, and uh, the same thing with staff, forming a group uh, with staff uh, with a strengths-based orientation so that they had an opportunity for the first time to get to know who each resident is as a person. Otherwise they have only clinical data, you know, uh, and that's not enough. Every person needs to be known. It's not, I think, therefore I am anywhere. It's I am known, therefore I am. I am respected and cared about, therefore I am. I am loved, therefore I am. So residents, when we're understaffed, and staff don't have a minute, they have to run from bathing to changing to feeding people and so on, so on. they don't have a minute, they must have an opportunity, a chance to know who each person is. We are all people with um, deep personal stories with um, uh, our own inner lives that are as unique to each of us as are our individual faces. And each of us needs to be known in home and community-based services and in nursing homes. Once that starts, the staff are extremely creative uh, in identifying problems and the solutions to those problems. And you build teams with the staff and it's glorious. Uh, for instance, one social worker whose work is, was incredible. She's now an ombudsman in Westchester. It was Sandy Myers. She discovered, well, she was uh, uh, assigned to work with a woman who was just admitted into the nursing home, a person who had been very competent and confident, but now was tremendously insecure and anxious because this former bookkeeper uh, had a terrible disease which um, resulted in amputations of both legs at significant parts of both hands. And so rather than dwelling just on her, commiserating with her loss, uh, Sandy in talking with her wisely said, oh, tell me about yourself and what are the things? And so with some sarcasm, she said, well, I'm fluent in five languages, that and a token won't get me on the subway anymore, will it? Fluent in five languages, Sandy said. What languages are you fluent in? Ah, oh, asking me again. All right, English, Russian, Yiddish, I, I, Hebrew. I, I don't remember what the fifth one was. I, I, don't, I truly don't remember. But I knew at the time. Sandy said, well, but maybe that could, please, Sandy, I, you know. But day after day, Sandy would say, you know, Mrs. So-and-so, I was thinking about you because, you know, there are um, uh, housekeepers in the nursing home 
who only speak Russian and they're very eager to learn English. Uh, they have children. They don't know how to buy in English. They don't know how to buy clothes for the kids, how to buy shoes, socks, underwear, shirts, everything. Uh, they don't know how to buy food, onions, garlic. I, you know, they don't have the language for it. And I asked them and they said they would love, they have a half hour lunch break. They would love for someone to teach them some English so they could get by. You're here again, you know? But this Sandy, I was a bookkeeper, not a teacher. But Sandy could see that she was thinking. And when she approached this woman again, the woman said, all right, you know, and Sandy said, you know, you could just try it for one or two times. It's not going to kill you, you know, just see if you like it. So she gave her a yellow pad, her request and a pen. She started writing down things to remind herself. These turned out to be highly enjoyable sessions. The staff in their half hour lunch break looked forward to them, loved it. The woman was very good at it with a great sense of humor. They started bringing in um, dishes, Russian dishes that they made. They enjoyed each other's company. Um, and uh, she said, you never guess what they want to learn how to say in English. So here's a person dealing with frailty with all her anxiety about it now in the role of being contributory to other people's lives at the ripe old age of 88 or something. We all want to be contributory. Uh, the other thing in nursing homes is the calendar it gives you an opportunity uh, to change. Every day is new and fresh. Um, so there was another occasion where um, a man who had been um, a hero in World War II was near death. And his brother said to Sandy, um, you know, I'm preparing a eulogy for my brother. I know, I know we're going to lose him soon. And Sandy said, why wait for his death? Let's honor him now. He said, how? She said, well, Veterans Day is next week. And so it was that residents, staff, and families were all assembled. And our World War II hero sat ramrod in his wheelchair, despite tremendous frailty and illness. And his brother pinned each medal on him, each time reading the citation for bravery, for heroism above and beyond the call of duty, et cetera, until his chest was covered with medals and people cheering him and honoring him in life. And then two weeks later, he passed away. And so when Sandy asked the residents, how do we want to honor Mr. So-and-so? One man said, well, we've got to have taps. And Sandy said, well, how would we do that? And he said, I'll play it on the piano. And Sandy didn't say to him, she said, oh, that's a great idea. It's a wonderful idea. She didn't remind him that he used to play the piano brilliantly, complex works, but now was so frustrated with memory loss. He would just pound in frustration on the keys. He couldn't play anymore. She called his wife and she appeared every day for those two weeks, taped middle C on the piano and helped her husband. So when it was time for the memorial for our hero, uh, everyone was assembled and he played taps and there wasn't a dry eye in the place because we're honoring the death of one hero and witnessing the birth of another who despite his frustrations was able to honor his friend the hero by playing taps. There are so many stories. Uh, I just want to say that um, a word about staff, there's too much to cover and I see I'm running out of time. I want to conclude with something about uh, CNAs, those wonderful people, the heroic certified nursing assistants who, prov who provide most of the direct care of residents. The issue of understaffing is paramount. The issue of their being underpaid is paramount. Some of them don't make a living wage. Most of them don't make a living wage. And so they have to work multiple shifts in order to survive. But in all the surveys I read, about satisfaction of certified nursing assistants. The one thing they mention over and over again is uh, that's upsetting to them is they never have a voice. They have to obey everything. They don't have a voice in helping, in, in helping change things and helping transform nursing homes in helping uh, better serve each resident. And that has been for them the most difficult. So when I met with staff on all three shifts in so many different facilities, um, uh, we would talk about these issues. And one man said, uh, we're gonna end it in a minute. One man said, um, you know, um, 
where I come from, uh, we, we don't have terrible places like this. So what country are you from? I'm from Ghana. And in Ghana, did you come from a big city, from Accra or a big city or from a little town? I came from a village, I'm Ashanti. And in my village, every older man or woman was, the, was revered, was the chief. We have a name for it in my language. It was called Nana, N-A-N-A. And uh, they were national treasures, not like here where they're disparaged and dismissed and not even known. And when one of them died, the whole village wept at the loss of this important person in our lives. And so I said to him, Mr. Mensah, you've told us the most important thing. This was in our, my first meeting with this evening staff. I said, because we need you. We need you to transform this unit into your Ashanti village so that every man and woman here is known and respected and is the chief and is Nana. Tears streaming down his face and everyone else's. And he did, and the others did. Mrs. Anchala Banker from Ethiopia, uh, people from Jamaica, the staff were incredibly responsive. And whenever there was a problem, I would keep reframing it until they came up with the solution to what was wrong and how to make it better. And they got very, very good at it. It's uh, called uh, by Aunt Dr. Angela McBride, a nurse, I think and she's in Kentucky, being not the sage on the stage, but the guide by the side, you know? And they did beautifully. And by the way, uh, it's been a great privilege to meet staff from countries that are not as ageist as ours. Staff from African, Asian, Caribbean countries. So there are implications about immigration laws. We need more and more of these people and their uh, 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 non-ageist, creative and wonderful minds at hearts uh, to help us improve services. Uh, I believe I'm running out of time. At some point, I hope we get to have a chance to talk about home and community-based services too, or maybe in a different forum. Um, and uh, I appreciate so much that uh, so many of you have tuned in. And I hope you will carry this mantra that elder lives matter. Elder lives matter. Each person's life is precious at every age. Uh, it doesn't, our value doesn't diminish the older we get. Our value doesn't diminish the more frail we become uh, uh, because elderly people can help prepare the next group of people uh, for this experience. Uh, I thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you get active in this movement, the Elder Lives Matter movement, uh, that you get active politically uh, and uh, in, keep being engaged civilly. And I hope many of you will volunteer post-COVID to help make nursing homes and home and community-based services, the places where people can really thrive and help ourselves be strengthened physically, intellectually, and socially. Thank you so much. Kathy, thank you. That was really extraordinary. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing uh, just such a, a, a thoughtful and and meaningful program. Uh, we have, it's 1.53. Uh, Kathy, I think you said you could stay on for a few minutes longer. Maybe we'll go, to, so I'm gonna go quickly through, I just have some slides, excuse me, that I wanted to, to, um, um, to talk about. And they really relate to, this is Kathy, excuse me. Um, they relate to just some of the requirements for some of the things that I knew Kathy was going to be speaking about today, and then some of the resources, and I'm just gonna to touch upon them on our website. So we'll, uh, it's six up now, I'm gonna to try to finish up in about five, um, seven minutes, and then we'll allow up to two, uh, we'll stay on to 2.10 for those who want to stay on for some Q&A, and we'll try to get to as many people as possible. Um, so I just wanted to kind of circle back to what Kathy had, had said, and this is, always our starting point as well, is that the nursing home reform law, uh, also known as over 87, which as Kathy mentioned, that's because it passed in 1987. It's the federal law and it requires that every single nursing home resident is provided care and quality of life services that he or she needs to attain and maintain his or her highest practicable physical, emotional, and psychosocial well-being. All three of those things, it's kind of a mouthful. Um, what does highest practicable mean? Um, it doesn't mean highest practical 
for the nursing home based upon what, how much profit it wants to make, how much it's paying its administrators, et cetera. It means highest practicable. It means that this is not a warehouse in which you're providing set services or set things for a space for, for a box of light bulbs or you're, you're, you're shipping um, you know, even chickens or, or, or whatever across country, which we would want the, that to be done humanely as well. But when it comes to nursing home residents, understanding, as Kathy has been saying, that these are, are human beings and that every, every iota of care, every approach that is taken by a staff person, whether that be the CNA or a nurse or a therapy service person or an administrative person is really geared towards meeting that resident where he or she is and helping to foster their highest, what they're most capable of doing. As Kathy was talking about, just that tremendous example of the person who had the, um, the oxygen tank and enabling her to be able to exercise, not, not to exercise, excuse me, not to say, oh, you have this oxygen tank, you can't do what we have. And that's all we can think about doing because this is our tunnel vision with which we approach our residents it's thinking, okay, this is our resident. She or he, but she in this instance, wants to do a physical activity. How do we make it happen? Doesn't mean you have to go out and, and spend $10,000 or $20,000 on special equipment. It means just spending a few minutes to think as you would want to for yourself or for, some, for anyone that you loved. Um, think about, okay, how do we make it happen for this person. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to touch one more thing on the on the reform law. And that's in the second bullet here is that it, the law lays out uh, specific resident rights, but it also everything which, you know, everything that the law and the rules call for really hit on providing good care, monitoring residents who need uh, you know, need help, need to make sure that they are safe, et cetera, especially many residents who have cognitive impairment, but ensuring that there is a good quality of life that is meaningful and that maximizes that resident's choice, dignity, and their autonomy. Uh, and we understand there were some comments of, um, I know as the people saying, you know, about home and community-based services and people getting care in their home, but as, as, as Kathy mentioned, especially at the very start of her program, um, we're not this is this is we're not saying that there should be no home and community-based services. There should definitely be home and community-based services, but there will always be a need for residential care settings. There'll always be people who need to have 24-hour day nursing, which is the definition of of a um, of a nursing home or who needs to be in a nursing home, people who need 24 hours a day nursing or you know, a monitoring for their care, maybe medication management, other services, et cetera. For some people that can happen at home, that's something we, we certainly uh, support for those who want that. Uh, but this is a congregate setting should also be something that is desirable. And the rules and the laws, everything that Kathy was talking about in terms of how some, some places around the country, not many, but some are implementing it, are realizing that, that this should be, I mean, they're, they're, you know, some people want to live on their own, but for some people that may not be desirable. It might be better for them if, if the reform law was implemented, if, we, if, if, if people lived by and carried out these standards, that this could be a pleasant congregate setting for people where, where you wouldn't be isolated, you, you wouldn't be stuck maybe in front of the TV, or um, you know, you know, there's no perfect setting. Uh, it's really finding the setting and having the right to access care in the setting that is right for you. So I wanted to talk about, and, and those of you who are familiar with our work, we have uh, you know, a lot of the residents' rights uh, materials and the quality of care materials on our website. We have a primer, P-R-I-M-E-R, uh, which is free, which has about three dozen or so of the most important uh, residents' rights uh, and quality care uh, standards that we thought that come up in day-to-day -day advocacy. But I wanted to just highlight a few of them here 
I'm just looking quickly at my at my watch. So here, these are again requirements under the rules, the federal rules for every single nursing home resident, no matter who pays for his or her care. I don't care if it's Medicaid. I don't care if it's Medicare. No one should be told we don't have enough. We're not getting enough money from you. Um, that or, or that you we can't provide you the care and the therapy services, et cetera, to live the life. Um, that you're entitled to. So very quickly, uh, a facility must care for its residents, not, not should, not can if it feels like it, not may if it has enough money, a facility must care for its residents in a manner and in an environment that promotes maintenance or enhancement of each resident's quality of life. Again, focus on the individual. Uh, facilities must promote care for residents in a manner that maintains or enhances each resident's dignity and respect in full recognition of his or her individuality. These are not pie in the sky things that I that I made up or that I'm wishing for. These are again the federal rules must must be happening. And it when it's not happening, that is a violation of those that person's rights as a person and also of his or her rights as a resident in a licensed nursing home. I'm just going to skip ahead. Um, medically related social services it sounds like what, what the heck does that mean? But it means that the facility must provide medically related social services to attain or maintain, the, again, the highest practicable physical, mental, and psychosocial well being of each individual. And I just want to, you know, I'm going to move on um, to talk about a few of the tools so we can have some time for QA. But CMS here says in further into this guide, guidance that it expects facilities to really take action on this. This is not a passive right. This is a right and an expectation. Again, a must, not a can, not a may, a must that facilities are supposed to be supposed to be actively um, engaging making sure that there's appropriate staff to do this, making sure that the staff are really communicating with their residents and making it happen. Not again, not, not this passivity that we see on the parts of nursing homes too often, in my knowledge and reading and experience that they're kind of putting out there what they feel like, they're, like they are and that's enough. That's not enough, it has to be resident focus. The reform law, the nursing home reform law of 1987 is really, a very special law because it focuses on meeting the resident where he or she exists and making sure, must, must, must ensure that the quality of life is, is meaningful and important and tailored to the resident's goals, his or her wishes, psychosocial needs, et cetera. Uh, so I'm gonna talk quickly about some of the tools that we have. Um, this, this is a, the front page of our website. As you can see, we have a learning center. We have a data center. We provide a lot of information on staffing, which, as Kathy was saying, is, is really probably the most critical issue um, when it comes to the quality of care and the quality of life for both residents and, as Kathy said, for the staff themselves. So and everything on our website is free to use and free to share. If you want to take something and cut it out and put it, your own name on it, that is fine with us. Our goal is really to get the information and the resources out there. Uh, so this is what our learning center looks like. We have a family and arms resource center. We have a special toolkit on dementia care and antipsychotic drugging to improve dementia care and reduce drugging. Uh, we have a, a whole bunch of materials on identifying and addressing abuse and neglect. Uh, I'm gonna put in a quick plug here, our podcasts and our webinars, they're all free and available. Eric hosts our, our podcast and they're so interesting. They're just like generally at 20, 25 or so minutes, really interesting to listen to if you're on that treadmill or if you're in your car um, or just need a break from you know whatever you're doing. I, I find them, you know, sometimes when I'm cooking dinner, I'll put one on because it's just, um, they're very informative and, and it, but in a very engaging way. Uh, this is a picture of our family and almonds resource center. I just circled here. We are actually providing free private Zoom rooms for family councils if they want to meet. Uh, we'd be happy to do this for resident councils too. We, we have, uh, if there's a resident council that has uh, access to the internet, uh, but it's a free Zoom room that you can use to schedule your own uh, private family council. 
Uh, and this is, we did this in regard to, or in response to COVID when families could no longer go into facilities. But I think that it will be even useful beyond, you can always take that Zoom on your phone or on an iPad or whatever into the nursing home when we do go back and having other people. I mean, I'm on, 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 Zoom, on Zoom meetings where people come in from Israel and they come in from across the country. So you can really bring in family members there and, and further empower your family council. And I am going to, oh, I just want to quickly show two things. One, this is our toolkit on, excuse me, this is our fact sheet on resident rights. And it talks about um, dignity. It talks about respect and privacy for the residents. Again, this is on our website. You can see here's the link at the bottom, but they are, we have a bunch of fact sheets and they were always building as we identify new issues. And lastly, and I'm going to turn it over to Q&A, is this is a resident preferences form. And I actually, developed is not because of my professional work, because I remember when my aunt was in a nursing home and people didn't really know what she wanted. Um, they didn't even know how to refer to her. Um, and, um, you know, she didn't want to be sweetie. That to her was, was kind of demeaning, you know, sometimes sweetie or honey. Some people like that, some people don't. Um, but she, but this is a form that we put together um, to, um, let people know um, what things the resident enjoys. What are their musical and TV preferences? So sometimes if someone, especially someone who may have dementia is becoming agitated, music can be very helpful. A bath may be helpful if they like a bath, but if they don't like a bath, the bath will be very disruptive. So you know, making sure that people on all shifts know this is just a useful tool. And lastly, and before we go to Q&A, our next program is on May 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern. It's gonna be on our advocacy priorities for 2021 and beyond. We have a um, obviously a new presidency in Washington. We have um, a uh, Senate, Congress, I should say, that is um, uh, hopefully gonna move on some of the issues that are important to, to um, nursing home residents and care staff and their families. And on the state level as well, I think about the state and the federal level, there should be opportunities after, as we kind of emerge from COVID-19 of how can we, what do we want to see happen to ensure that residents are protected? Uh, and I'm going to start by, I know we had some, first of all, stop sharing. There we go. And I know we got some questions. We have a lot of questions and some people raise their hands and I'll, I'll try to get you in if I can. I apologize. Um, we generally don't um, work with the hand raising, so I don't really know how to do that very well. Um, so here is question number one from Mary. Um, how do you communicate this important information to elected officials in a meaningful way that impacts legislation? Oh, Mary, um, that's a wonderful question, and, and I think we should all think about that. Um, uh, I write to elected officials on a regular basis. Um, and I find I have to watch myself because sometimes I get too um, formulaic. And uh, I'm trying instead to write uh, in a more personal way to each official to try to really reach them. Uh, my experience is that most uh, of the politicians that I know at any rate, uh, still haven't gotten the, the message, no matter what we say. They may have a, once a year a senior event uh, and, and open it up like a party as if to honor seniors. And it's really, when you think of the issues, it's really very patronizing. So I think uh, relationships that one develops uh, with public officials is really important. Um, and I think uh, to start uh, owning the fact that these issues are not peripheral. These are not inconsequential. They are central to who we are as a country. And so I think we should also write to people like um, Elizabeth Warren and uh, Senator Bob Casey of uh, Pennsylvania, who's always championed, for years championed elder rights, uh, admiring the work of his father before him as Senator. Uh, also, um, uh, the guy in, in the Senator, I'm sorry, Sheldon Whitehouse in Rhode Island, might be a good resource because he's written passionately about uh, corporate interference with the rights of average people. Uh, and also since Susan Rice has been appointed to such an important position in domestic policy, I think that all of us should begin to write. Uh, if you're tempted to send me a joke, 
in an email about older people, I would much prefer you not do that. I would much prefer that you write to an elected official uh, about the seriousness of this issue. Uh, uh, and, and so Mary, if you have ideas or others have ideas, it's really important uh, also that politicians um, are accustomed to taking contributions. And I'm really pleased that politicians are just beginning, the ambitious ones, are just beginning to return those, those contributions to nursing home providers and to the trade associations because they realize that we're tracking it. It's not acceptable with conditions the way they are in nursing homes and in home and community-based services for politicians to be taking money from those industries. It's really, uh, I, we need campaign finance reform. So think of uh, addressing it in that way also, Mary. And you may have other ideas, I don't know. Uh, Richard, you may have ideas about this. Um, no, I, I think that maybe also, um, you know, both on the state and the federal level, speaking out, especially to the committees that the, 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 you, the, the um, excuse me, like a health committee um, in an assembly or the Senate, um, and certainly in the uh, U.S. Senate, the um, uh, Senate Finance is important. There's sure. the Senate Special Committee on Aging. So especially if you're if your um, uh, senators are on that, um, both on the state and the federal level. So on the state on the federal level, if your individual Congress people or senators are on one of those committees, and then on the state level, uh, in particular, if you're um, if your assembly member or state senator is on a health or aging committee, it's really helpful because that's where a lot of these things generate. And it's always helpful to talk to them because what we hear now is, you know, people get a lot of pushback from the industry. You know, mostly if we don't speak out, they hear from providers. They hear from providers all the time. By providers, I mean the nursing homes and their trade associations or lobby groups. They're very powerful on the state on the state level and on the federal level. And too often they, they pose themselves as being, they call themselves nursing home advocates. And which is interesting, but they're advocating for the nursing home as an industry. They're not advocating for the nursing home for the residents who are being served. And that is very confusing. I think conflated both in state legislators and federally. Um, so let's just take um, maybe two more questions. I'm gonna look for one that's short. I'm sorry for people that, that were missing you. Here, uh, George asked, can Kathy provide a little more detail on the daycare program initiative? Um, there, there isn't, to, I may have misspoken. Uh, there isn't a daycare uh, program initiative that I'm aware of. What I was, what I was addressing were um, uh, programs that uh, we had years ago uh, for older people who were blind and who had uh, other physical challenges. And um, uh, the tremendous, um, um, tremendously positive response from those participants, it was a huge program in New York City that then expanded into a couple of boroughs um, where people uh, learned all kinds of uh, art forms. Um, and, and that's what I'm advocating we begin to think about for senior centers we need public support for it, obviously. I'm not aware that one exists, but that would be the direction where people can actually uh, participate uh, with other people. It's a great way to socialize when you're quilting or sewing or knitting. And these were people who were totally blind to do these things. And there also was a woodworking class and, and, and you don't usually equate that with blindness, with saws and stuff, but we did. One man was making a fire engine for his grandson that the, that, the, that the grandson could sit on and then a toddler, you know, could kind of walk with it. A woman decided she wanted to join the woodworking class. She was the only woman in that class because what she wanted was she wanted to make out of wood a kitchen stool. And she said it would have, um, that the seat would have a hinge on it and it would be a place where she could hide her money and a small bottle of scotch and put some pot holders and dish towels and stuff on top of it, close the lid, cover it with something nice that would soft, soft when she sat on it. So she could sit at the kitchen counter, chop her vegetables or whatever, onions and stuff like that. But when her grandson would visit and would ransack her place, imagine a, a blind grandmother and he was looking for money. <laughs> 
and he would never think to find it in her kitchen stool, uh, uh, you know, hidden away her money and her small bottle of scotch because every Saturday night her best friend would come over and the two of them would have a drink. So her grandson would threaten that all the time. So she was in a woodworking class and a man, the only woman in that class, and a man joined the all women's sewing class because he said he had never sewn in his life, but his wife's birthday was in five months or something like that. And her favorite color was lavender. And he wanted to know, could the sewing teacher teach him how to sew? And could he make a lavender caftan for his wife for her birthday? He said, I can't think of anything that would make her more moved. She knows I can't, I'm a klutz, I can't sew, I can't do this, I can't do that. And he joined the sewing class and the women uh, really enjoyed his presence, helped him, encouraged him. And he finally made that caftan, that beautiful lavender caftan for his wife's birthday. So we're looking at how do we have crafts? How do we have artwork available in nursing homes and uh, in senior centers? Uh, that's what I'm, I'm hoping we can help achieve. Thank, Thank you, you, Kathy. Um, I'm, we're going to end it there. Uh, I just wanted to say that we're going to invite Kathy back again, um, maybe in the fall, as soon as as soon as we can can schedule her. So if you have questions or topics that you would like for her, you know, based upon some of the things she's talked about today and, and her work, um, please feel free to pass them on. You can email info at ltccc.org, info at ltccc.org. And, and Kathy and, and Eric and Haley and I will talk about, you know, her next program and uh, would be interested in any feedback. So thank you all very much for joining us. Kathy, again, thank you so much. Thank you. I uh, uh, really appreciate it. And uh, you'll have a nice afternoon. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye.